everyone. I am, uh, I am actually really excited to be here. I came to this meetup quite a few times in the past and been an audience member, so super excited to uh, be speaking to all of you about some technology we enabled in the past. We have a kind of uh, funny story, though. I, um, you know, we built this technology two to four years ago. Uh, our founder was, like, really protective of it, and then we finally patented it. And we started talking about this and a few other ones maybe about, like, six months to a year ago. Um, and I gave this talk at a different, um, a different meetup and I had a, one or two more, and then I ended up transitioning roles. So we're going to do a kind of a blast from the past and talk about, uh, the real, real, how many people here know what the real, real is just show of hands, okay, maybe like 25, 30%. Would anybody go on a limb and try to describe what the real, real is? Yes. I think it's something that you can kind of uh, trusted uh, community where you can sell luxury fashion and you kind of got ver get verified that it's actually legit. Uh, that's how I would describe it. And it's both online and in stores. Yeah, that was pretty good. So, um, so we have online, luxury, fashion consignment marketplace is how I'd say that one too. So value add for, so we take in, we, the real real doesn't have any supplier. It gets all its inventory from individual people. So we think of it like contrasted to eBay, except, um, you know, eBay, if you buy like a Rolex watch or $10,000 item, you're wondering like, is this fake? Do I have to, how am I going to get remuneration if I get a bad actor? Um, for the real real, so they, they take uh, that responsibility. And then for a seller, they do all the attribution. So if you're on, um, if we take it back to eBay, you as the seller are the one typing up the description, taking a photo, pricing, et cetera. All that happens at the real real. And the real real takes in something like 20,000 items a day and, and does all these tasks. Um, they sell a lot of products in the categories of, low, of um, handbags, clothing, shoes, jewelry, and watches. Um, and so the question is like, what would an AI and ML team focus on in an online luxury consignment marketplace? So we did a lot with the 20,000 items that come into the uh, facility every day. They have to be authenticated. Uh, you have to describe it, uh, fabric content, condition, uh, the description of it, take a photo of it. We have to retouch those photos. So there's a lot to um, enhance kind of that inbound flow. And that's not visible to end users, but we're going to talk about one of the technologies and give you behind the scenes uh, view of the, what we enabled. Um, so what is automated retouching? Uh, the basic here is like we take a, uh, a photograph of a garment on a mannequin, um, and this is a raw photo at a photo station, and then we apply a series of transformations, and we output, let's call this a website quality photo. And the goal here is that we want to give a consistent look and feel to every item on the site. So even though it's secondhand, uh, we were going for the same look and feel as you would get from a primary retailer that like there, everything would be consistent with the same crop. Um, and the only thing that would change would be the garment on the mannequin. Um, and that's very different from something like eBay or some other peer-to-peer uh, -peer sites where it might be jarring as you kind of go through. Um, here are kind of two simple examples to start with and we'll get more complex. But what made the problem really challenging is we had this single SKU constraint. So we had to uh, represent each item as is. And I'll just give a description of this. So let's say you and I both purchased a Rolex watch from a manufacturer. I wore mine every day for 10 years. You never wore yours. We would expect them to have different price points because one has more wear than the other, different condition description. And well, of course, we have to represent the uh, photo of the item as is. So each item gets its own photo. It gets cataloged as a unique item. Uh, the second constraint is we have to meet uh, very high acceptance criteria of merchandisers. Um, so uh, we couldn't reimagine this transformation process. Uh, we had to have the output as is. And even for a human to do this task, uh, they would fail like uh, maybe 2% of the time. So it was a very high standard. And you'll see as we show how we would solve it, that each individual component has to have super high accuracy. Okay, so how would we start by solving this problem? First question you might ask is like, hey, do we even have enough data to solve this with AI and ML? The answer is yes. We had a lot of uh, products that come in. They would get set to a, um, 
input uh, S3 bucket and then we transformations would apply and then they'd get sent to an output. So we had a ton of data, uh, 20,000 products a day. Each product had three, six images. So 100,000 products a day for many years. Uh, second question is, do we have to, you know, label these individual tasks with targets? Um, and the answer is no, we were able to generate these labels automatically. Uh, we were able to do so using this process, if you're familiar with image registration. And since we knew the output and the input images were the same item, we could find matching key points in both images. We can take the inliers of those key points and estimate a homography matrix. And what that does is it can take one image and put it in a transform perspective of the other image. And that can be things like uh, increasing, reducing size. It can be rotation. It can be a lot of linear kind of transformations that you can apply. Uh, so once in this transform perspective, what we can do is some interesting things just using classical computer vision approaches where we can say like, okay, let's take the ratio of the height of the output image to the input image. And here it'll be like 60%. And we can bucket that to something like, okay, this input image, when it comes in at prediction time, we have a label that it needs to be cropped here at the mid length. And we see that we did this kind of thing with each of our uh, individual components that we've cascaded together uh, to build kind of this end-to-end -end solution. So here's what our overall pipeline looks like uh, for a high-level solution um, to do the retouching enablement. So it starts with this, uh, this input image over here on the left, on the right. I have that same tricky challenge. Uh, just take notice to this, so like how small this seam is, because I'm going to come back to this a few times in the overall image. Uh, but the first step we do is we, um, we remove the background and the base here. So we're doing some semantic segmentation approaches. Uh, next, we seek to align the mannequin through a rotation. So some mannequins are old. They have this tilt. And here we um, align it to be uh, perpendicular. Uh, next, we heal the shoulder seam. And again, that's where that little, um, where the arm meets the body, there's that little seam there. Uh, and we'll break that down and go into depth on that. Uh, next, we make the crop of like where to crop the item. We match the aspect ratio. Operationally, we'll store um, this in an S3 bucket and produce an event uh, so engineering knows to pick it up and can process the inbound flow. Um, so let's do a deep dive into the, the toughest area of this, which is, of course, these shoulder seams. So... Here it's like zoomed in so we can see it the best. It's also a sleeveless item, which is the easiest when a shoulder seam is present uh, task to solve, but it's still super difficult. Uh, one, because the, we have to operate on this very razor thin margin where we don't make a mistake. And how can we make mistakes? Well, again, we have the single skew constraint. So any alteration we make to a product is a failure. So if we're trying to blend the seam and we accidentally blend into the garment, it's a, it's the easy way to make a failure. Uh, the second way is like, if we go into the background, it's perfectly white and we make the background not perfectly white, obviously a failure. And the third way, if you look at this, this has a lot of lighting uh, directly on the seam. So if we make anything that looks unnatural in that lighting, it's also a failure. So we really have to heal, heal this seam with some surgical precision. So we broke this down into a number of components. Um, so the first things first is like, does this item contain a seam? And we call this joint detection. So in a lot of items like a coat or a long sleeve item, you're not gonna have a seam at all. So we don't wanna do any further steps. Um, so let's see, we got a seam. So the next step, the next step is we generate a new image without a joint. So, you know, why the heck would we do this? Well, we really struggled here. We, we, we spent a lot of months trying to solve this problem. We were trying to approach this from a like an in-painting perspective where we were gonna predict what pixels are the seam and then take some surrounding pixels and copy them into the seam and add some blur. And that was like a general approach. And that kind of worked in a way. It was like 60% accuracy. We added some new flavors and got that up to like 70%, but we were looking to try to be above like 95% for our AC. So we were like struggling with this for a while. It was, it was really challenging. We didn't know if we were gonna solve it. Um, this was back in 2019 and we're at this hackathon and uh, the moment for us is like, um, this is back when GANs were the cutting edge of Gen AI. If you remember that, 
And if you remember the time, what it was like uh, back then, what the perception of GANs were, it was like um, kind of like a toy, but they were like rapidly improving very fast. And we were trying different approaches, like, let's just give it a shot. And we came in and the, the next day, like when we looked at the results after training it all night, they were like way better than anything we had done before. It was like a step function increase in, in our aptitude. And it was better than this one here. We have one in this image with some um, reconstruction loss and blur, but uh, these are generally pretty good. But the challenge with it was twofold. One's like you had to keep the input image uh, kind of smaller and the output image smaller to keep the parameters of the GAN reasonable. It's hard to train GANs. And then if you know about this, it, some GANs have this um, feature where they uh, add some, like the color gets slightly distorted on the output from the input. And you can kind of mitigate this with like a identity constraint in the loss function, but then you're kind of changing like the reconstruction error. It could go up when you do these things. So it, it's kind of tricky. So we were already so far into the process, we didn't want to try to perfect it. So we're like, I think we can use some of the other features that we've enabled from the prior version that didn't work, like the segmentation mask and post-process it. So we decided to post-process it. So we had this uh, product segmentation mask from before. So when we blend it, we can make sure that we don't alter the garment at all in the blending process. That's that middle segmentation mask. And then uh, what we do is we take a difference between the GAN generated output of a shoulder seam and the original output. And we're able to create this um, interpolation for blending. So up here in the upper right is when it's fully black, it's 100% the original image. When it's fully white, it's 100% the generated image. And then when it's like some value in between, we do this weighted average between the two. And then voila, we finally got to a healed shoulder seam who knew they could be so difficult and if i look back at this as like a, a tech leader i'd say like this is a really complex process but it was one by far that produced ultimately the highest uh pass rate and allowed us to move forward and add 20 percent to supply which was a huge win okay so now we can do a lot of tasks we can crop center align uh we can um, heal a shoulder seam uh, what could be left so the last step we had in our process is deployment. So we had this interesting challenges here as well. We had, um, on some days we had to uh, retouch 100,000 images and send the results back in less than an hour. And we wanted to do this as cheap as possible. And um, we don't know when they're coming. We could sometime in the afternoon, 2 p.m., 4 p.m., 3 p.m., not sure. Uh, the one thing that we did have going for us was that no skew depended on any other skew to do this processing. There was no state we had to uh, keep track of. So uh, it could be paralyzed really well. And that's really what we leaned into. So how it works is uh, a user will upload a batch of images. So uh, the 20,000 SKUs to S3, as each SKU gets all its images uploaded, it produces an event to Kafka. We consume the event and then we spin up a new cloud run worker for each SKU. And these cloud run workers are not optimized. They take 30 to 60 seconds to do the end-to-end -end processing. But since the, uh, it can grow horizontally so well, the whole system's super fast. So we can have thousands of these workers operating in parallel, just chewing out this workload. Um, and then they write the results to S3 and they shut down. And that was a really nice thing from a cost perspective. We only had these running uh, less than five hours um, a week and we, we ran it for a while. It was only, I think it was operating at less than $100 a month uh, until we started growing really high in, in our supply coverage. And then it got much more expensive. But um, you'll see here, uh, just because this question popped up before, uh, AWS and GCP, we were just in GCP. AWS is where our engineering team did. So there was no plan to do it this way. It just happened organically. That was a question. So... Okay, so we got all this stuff done. What's the business value? We were able to save a you know, million dollars a year. It was really exciting. We automated 87% of our supply. We had a one to three day reduction in time to launch a product to site. So as a real, real seller, you submit your item, you're waiting it to launch the site, waiting it to sell and finally get your money. So reducing that time was a big thing. And we filed a patent. It was really cool. It wasn't all roses though. We had a lot of challenges and um, here are a couple. So some lessons and reflections, and these are kind of organizational lessons, but they're good to keep in mind. 
uh, one of the things that we kind of got stuck in is like, we were allowing all sorts of data and we're trying to solve every problem with AI and machine learning. But the challenges we were getting on the edge cases was like, um, we had this shoulder seam problem that was already difficult to solve. And then we were getting things like a, a mannequin that had a, a very chewed up shoulder. Like it's just been taken on and off a ton of times and it causes some downstream impact where like we didn't see this enough in the training data. And it was like, hey guy, hey, ML team, this is not working, solve this better, right? And then here's a couple of examples where the mannequin arm wasn't really attached to the body and it caused some you know, downstream impact. And the solution was always AI and ML. And we eventually pushed back, but I think we could have built a much simpler solution a lot faster, got to business impact faster if we were just like, hey, give me a mannequin that's not all uh, you know, chewed up in garbage and make sure you put the arm on, right? Um, so learn from me, set data capture standards early. Uh, second one was um, kind of related, but uh, we said really test uh, impact on user metrics were possible. So again, if you remember the shoulder seam here, this bust here is already really very much zoomed in. Um, if you go to a PDP, a product detail page on the real reel, it's like full shot. So we're already zoomed in here. And if we really zoom in with a magnifying glass, you can see some artifacts. And this happens in maybe, I don't know, uh, two to... 5%, depending on the day, maybe 7%, if it's a bad day. And we see some artifacts that we don't want, right? Like we don't want this, so it should have healed that. That's a tricky one, but it should have done it. Here's really tricky. It's like overlapping with the garment. Um, here's like a little notch. And again, it was a similar thing, like it, test on user metrics. The big thing we would ask at the end, we eventually got there is like, is this gonna stop somebody from buying the product, right? And, and the answer was no, you know, there was no difference in sell through. So um, again, we kind of got there a lot faster uh, and build a more simple solution. And the last lesson I have is um, we had this tricky kind of cascading pipeline, right? Where uh, we built one machine learning model to make the prediction that fed into another one that fed into another one, fed into another one. Um, the tricky thing here is like we make a component change and we have like a loss function for that and evaluation. We didn't have one way to do an end to end sweep. We were always like looking for human reviews or QCers. Um, and uh, this kind of slowed down our iteration cycle because we had to uh, get on their timeline when they could review. And it was, you know, a big job. We had to review like 500 and like we would wait for that feedback. We would make so it's like, how can we speed that up? We were making guesses. Well, I think this will pass, you know, when we send it over or we started waiting like the individual components as like a proxy. Um, at the end, uh, we talked about like, well, let's just build a classifier. We have a lot of QC data that'll probably do a good enough job. We didn't solve this fully, but just something to always keep in mind, you know, the faster we can iterate, develop new solutions, the faster we can make impact. And that was kind of like our journey and our story on this project, it, it had a huge impact. We had like um, a lot of uh, successes and learnings along the way. Um, I just wanna partake, uh, give to all of you my learnings as like speed up the iteration cycle, uh, test impact on user metrics, set data capture standards early and test newer technological approaches often because they can have a big, huge impact. So thank you all so much.